there's a lot of talk about, oh, work-life balance. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think it's work-life integration. How am I going to integrate my personal life into my professional life? Because it's not like you leave um, your studio and suddenly you're a different Armando. You, you're the same person. It's just, it's a different forum, right? Yeah. Hey, I'm Armando LaDuke, producer, film actor, and owner of LaDuke Entertainment. I have chosen a life off the beaten path and wanted to find others that are doing the same. Spaghetti on the Wall is a show based on all of the years that I've thrown spaghetti on the wall and nurtured what stuck. We will share fun stories, ideas, tips, tricks, and more. Welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on when you are catching the podcast. Spaghetti on the Wall, ladies and gentlemen. Back with another one, Bernadette Catalana. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Armando? Um, doing fantastic. It's amazing to be inside where there's AC because it's really There you hot. go. Is it? <laughs> oh. It's not it's too good. bad in New York. So. I bet it's amazing right now. It's about to change colors, right? Aren't you guys? Um, we're a few weeks away from that, but the weather's definitely, today's a little sticky, but temps are definitely going in the right direction. That's so. awesome. Autumn so, in New York. So you're a, I know, that's a good song too. Autumn yeah. in New York, I love that too. Um, so you are an attorney in New York. I am. And you're an author. I am, I am. So talk, let's talk about your book and uh, and then we can get into the, uh, the lawyer stuff here in a second. But uh, tell me about your book. And what's it called? And okay, uh, and um, my book is called Daughter Lessons, and it was kind of a I don't know what you want to call it a passion project. I woke up one morning and I thought, wow, my kids are are growing up and and growing away, and I might I'm not going to see them every day. And then the thought dawned on me, well, there's going to be a day when I'm not going to be here at all. And, you know, I thought, wow, I really, I want to plan for that, not to be morbid, but I know that there are so many things that I don't know about my parents and didn't know about my parents that I would love to know, but I can't ask them anymore. So I thought, you know, what would my girls want to know about me, about my life, about what I think about things, you know, as, as their lives go on. So every day for a month, I sat down and I picked a different topic and just sat there and, and wrote a lesson. And then as you know, I got to the end of the month, I had all these lessons. And then you know, as time went on, I added to them and I had a group in Rochester, New York, uh, the Assisi Institute that has published some other books that loved the concept and they were really my angels they put the book together for me and i i, I can show you what it looks like uh that's uh me and my daughters on awesome. the cover. and uh it's been it's been a really fun and humbling experience uh the feedback that i'm getting from people from perfect strangers and from people that are in my world other lawyers has been um as I said, uh, really uh, touching and humbling. It's been great. That's amazing. So, yeah. Uh, is this your first book? Yes. Yes. Hopefully not the last. But it, it's a lot of work putting it together. I will. I will tell you. If, and anybody who's thought of it, it is no small feat. It's. I, I heard writing is rewriting. Oh, <laughs> it's all about the edit. Right? Because yeah. when it comes out of your mind, you're thinking about it in one way, and then you go back to read it, and you're thinking, oh, that wasn't exactly what I thought I said. So yeah, doing that. I mean, I had a, a friend who's one of my partners in the law firm. She was so kind. She read and edited the whole book, the entire book. I mean, that's a wow. friend, right? That's an amazing yeah. friend. Did you pay her for this? <laughs> uh, in my gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, <laughs> I will. I'm go I'm gonna I'm gonna pay her over on time on layaway, right? You know, it's so it's so funny. Have you ever read the book The Go Giver? I d I haven't. I'll have to it's, write that oh, down. Oh, such a fantastic book! But you know, it, it you know just the the principles of the book is is mainly you know just to do things without the expectation of getting something in return, 
right? And leading with how can I give first instead of how can I take first, right? And uh, you know, and and whatever, like she, you know, she she gave to you, and uh, whether whether or not she gets something back from you, it's probably not more important than the fact that she did it for herself to help you, and that she'll she's gotten something out of it, right? Like just by doing it. And that's the kind of person she is. So yes, I agree with that. And I think that um, is such a great concept that we don't talk about often enough in, in um, just in life generally. Um, certainly not in, in my business, in our business, the legal field is really, um, it can be very unkind. But um, I, I think about the most successful people in law, and those are the people who focus on service, right? That's what we want to do. We want to focus on service, serving our clients. So it doesn't have to be all this, you know, uh, testosterone-driven aggression. I mean, that's the stereotype. But when we break the stereotype, I think that's when we're serving our clients uh, better. So is that how you... So t talk to me about, because I know you guys do asbestos and then you guys do mass tort. Yeah. Um, how did you guys get into, how did you get into this? Um, you know, I, I actually went to law school after I had my first child. Um, I ha hadn't seen, so again, it always it circles back to the kids, which, which sounds a little silly, but you know, if you knew my story, it, it really isn't. I didn't have a lot of high aspirations then I had my first child and was very quickly pre pregnant with my second child. And I thought, wow, I better get a job. I, I, better, I better do something to make my kids uh, proud of me. And you know, also I wanted to support them. And I thought about it, well, what is it I'm good at? Well, I know I'm a good writer. So, oh, what professions do you need to be a good writer? Oh, well, lawyers have to be good writers. I mean, literally, that was my very simplistic <laughs> thought process um, to go to law school. But honestly, that really served me, uh, served me well. And having kids um, in law school was such a game changer. And I had such an advantage over the other people in class with me because I wasn't worried about who I was hooking up with on Saturday night. I was worrying about like, okay, I got to get this done. I got to be efficient. And then, you know, I got to get out of here, graduate in, in um, a, a reasonable amount of time so I can go to work and, and start earning some money. So um, my kids really have helped me very, be very successful um, as a lawyer too. It, it there, you, you can't, um, you, you can't call it out. You know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, work-life balance. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think it's work-life integration. How am I going to integrate my personal life into my professional life? Because it's not like you leave um, your studio and suddenly you're a different Armando. You, you're the same person. It's just, it's a different forum, right? Yeah. And when you go to work every day, you have the same, you know, you have the things going on in your personal life. They don't stop just because you're at the office. So I've used my commitment to my family to fuel what I do uh, professionally. And that formula has worked for me. That's awesome. I love the, um, I love that idea of work-life integration. Were you, are, are you, a, are you a baby person? Like, you know how, like, people are really good with, like, babies? <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I tend to like all ages. I, um, you know, it doesn't matter what the age. I do like uh, young people also. Just I've had a lot of foster kids come through my life as well. Um, I, I'll say more fo foster adults, you know, people who needed a place to live and that lived with me for, you know, six months, a year. Um, I, I, I like, I like, really like most people. So I, I have a hard, people. yeah, I, the, the reason I ask is, is, um, you know, like I, my wife and, 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 and the baby, like she does baby, she's four now, but she's so good with her. Right. And I find, you know, I try to like do fun things, you know, but like connecting with like babies or like toddlers. 
for me, it's like, oh, so cute, you know, but <laughs> in, in a way to like interact with, you know, with toddlers, it's very difficult for me, you know, and I'm wondering if, if people also have, you know, have that or is it just like a is it a man woman thing or it, it you know might be i mean you can never say anything applies to all people you know right. in the gender you know like all men are bad with babies all women are great with babies because we know that's not true but i do hear that from men that it's a little bit harder to maybe relate to the the, the little ones until they get to a certain age but i think for women i I'm one of seven children. Um, I'm the sixth child. So before I even had my own baby, I had, you know, I had real participation in raising lots of other kids. So it was just kind of natural for me. And, and to be perfectly honest, it was the first thing I ever did in my life, having my kids that I really felt confident about and like that I was important. Um, and it gave me the confidence to go to law school. I would never have gone to law school before I had my kids because I, I probably didn't feel like I could have done it. And um, the confidence I got from being a mother made me think, well, sure, I can do this. I, I can do this for them. Y'all are superheroes. I'll tell you that. I, like the, the way, you know, the, I, I, watch, I watch my wife and how she is able to juggle I juggle in different ways, you know, but like the way she juggles, like, cause she's also, you know, she, she works, you know, she's a professional. She's a, uh, she's an actress, singer, you know? And so she like balances all of that. Well, maybe she, maybe she makes it look effortless, you know, uh, inside maybe she's like, you know, uh, really working hard, but she just, you know, she makes that look so, so easy, you know, and the patience that comes from, you know, from that where you're just like, all right, I'm going to explain it to you like you like your four year old and it's OK, you know, and it's like and I'm like, uh, can you just do this now? Like, why are you not listening to me? You know what I mean? It's you know, it's, it's, it's funny but no, I, I think that we all come at it differently and and fathers are important, too. Um, my book has multiple chapters about fathers because uh, our fathers teach us how to charge into battle. That's my belief. Um, and if you don't have that as a young child, and I grew up much of my childhood without my dad, you spend a lot of time learning how to do that for yourself, charging into battle. So I, I think you know that, that mother energy and that nurturing uh, energy, whether you get it from your mom and your or your dad is important, but we also need to know how to uh, advocate for ourselves and stand up for ourselves. And I think um, more often than not, we get that from our dads. You, you look at some kids, right? And kids, you know, when you, if you give them too much, then they be, or do they become, you know, do they become lazy? How much do you not give so that they can, you know, so that they can have some motivation or is that innate or is that nur nature versus nurture like you know uh, and i'm like am i going to make mistakes i mean i know i'm going to make mistakes you know but like how do i limit the mistakes you know being a father and, and trying to trying to to raise a daughter that's that doesn't feel entitled that wants to work you know but i want to provide but not you know but still make it challenging you know, like, I, I, I think that's a challenge that, that we're, we're sort of having these days because things are so easy, right? And they're so, so simple for people. And we have everything that we've ever wanted, right? Like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, you know, sure. when you have all of that, like, how do you, how do you keep, you know, pushing, pushing your, your, your kids to, like, want to go and do things, you know? I think there's a couple of really basic things that I keep in mind, I, I guess, because I've raised two, um, I, I've successfully raised two humans. So I, I do have people ask me for my advice. And I also have a, a lot of enthusiasm for the job. So I do get this question. And first thing I will say is, 
um, you the biggest teacher um, is the example that you give your daughter so you and your wife and how you live your lives is going to flow down to her you don't even have to um, say hey let's sit down let's have a lesson about this she's gonna see what the two of you do and she is gonna model what you two do and if you're both hard-working people she's gonna be a hard worker I I promise you that she might not be a hard worker at five but by the time she gets to adulthood you will have hardwired that in into her so kids really um, they they learn what they see you doing in your life so you never even really have to say it she'll see it and she'll want to be like you. She really will. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have believed this when my kids were coming up. You know, we all have those terrible moments as parents. I remember calling my mother crying, saying, I'm so sorry for every mean thing I ever said to you. You know, crying, sobbing. And my mother, in her, in her cute wisdom, said, oh, you, you were not as bad as Carly. Carly's bad. You know, she was saying this about my daughter. Um, and she didn't mean it. She was just trying to make me stop crying, I think, and feel better. But um, it's, a, it's okay. They, they, in the end, the kids are, are all right in the end. You know, you just, you just gotta, you gotta love them and, you know, do your best. They, they also can know that you're human. I mean, we all make mistakes. My kids have seen me in some very low times and in a in a real way i think those are some of the best lessons i've given them because i've made comebacks from some you know pretty perilous places and you know they've seen me rise up and be strong when i you know when I, after feeling really down so you know again that example and that example that you give them never stops it just keeps keeps going and going and going um, it's it, it does work out truly that's awesome so you're not a therapist right so you I, don't... I'm not but I do have a lot of people who call me who call me about um, about parenting and and I love it I don't I don't mind at all and I think a lot of the skills that I have as a mother I brought to my practice as well you know that nurturing you know I, I have a whole team of lawyers that reports to me all across the country and I think uh, part of the reason why we've been successful is uh, I can see all of them you know just like you see your kids I see the strengths I see the areas that might you know we might need to work on a little bit but I'm always trying to build them up and you know do get the best result that we can get for our clients take pride in that um, so yeah I there, there are times where I feel like a therapist but that's okay we all need that we're, we're human beings you know this is just because you're a lawyer and it can be an unkind business doesn't mean that we have to uh, leave our humanity at the door every day right yeah hallelujah so you guys so asbestos is the primary focus. How did how did that become the focus of the uh, the firm? Well, I have only been with the firm for four and a half years. I ended up joining um, with MGM, the law firm, in January of 2019. So right before the pandemic. Um, and my my practice and and you asked me this question earlier, and I kind of skated around it. You said, "How did you get involved with asbestos?" Well, you know, just being the good Catholic girl that I am, uh, somebody, I think in my first six months at my very first job said, oh, Deanna's sick today and she can't cover that asbestos deposition. Will anybody, does anybody want to, uh, you know, cover for her? And of course I raised my hand and said, oh, sure, I'll do it. And, and that fateful move is what got me into um, this mass tort world. And um, it's, it's fun. I'm on the defense side, um, which is, you know, is, it's a side. It's a side. There's the defense side. There's the plaintiff side. And um, it's very interesting. I've met great people. I've met great people and have had um, fantastic challenges 
uh, doing this work and I really like it and I know when I started out they said oh this isn't going to last more than five years uh, and now we're talking uh, 28 years later and we're still doing it so yeah it's it's amazing um, how it's, it's like Aaron Brockovich well it, it's we're on the defense side so we're, okay. we're, we're representing the defendants but um, it, yeah it's a little different than that it's there is humanity in it though so when we're taking depositions often we're taking depositions of mm -hmm. Uh, the the plaintiffs who are very compromised and um, showing our humanity in that context for your opponent who is um, who is very sick likely um, doesn't have long for the world you know that's a real um, that can be a real challenge for a young lawyer figuring out how how to how do I do that how do I maintain my professionalism and uh, defend my client, the defendant, um, as vigorously as I am duty bound and ethically bound to do, but also have compassion for this person in front of me who is, who is very ill. And, um, you know, that's, that's not just a legal challenge, that's a human challenge. And it's, it's one that I think, um, you know, I can say in 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 this uh, sector of the law, there are, are many very fine people who manage to to have that balance. How do you find that nuance? Is it experience or? Um, yeah, I think one thing that's been really helpful for me is realizing that everybody plays their part in any lawsuit. So a lawsuit is very similar to sporting events, right? It's there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. Most of the time, that's the uh, that's how people look at it. But um, and along with that, there's a tendency or there can be a tendency in sports and in 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 law to villainize the other party. Oh, that person, they're bad, they're awful, they're, you know, plaintiff lawyers, they're, they're shady. Oh, defense attorneys, they're heartless, you know, all those names that, yeah, that, that happens. People go back and forth and they want to cast, um, cast people in a role. And, you know, I've always looked at it a little differently. Everyone's playing their part. Just like I take the defense of my clients very seriously and, and always want to do the best that I can, well, the plaintiff lawyers have the exact same, exact same calling and ethical duty for their clients. And once you understand that, it, it really gets a lot easier. Um, and you can be professional with the other side. And, and you realize that it isn't always about winning or losing. You know, it's letting letting it unfold and being professional, being uh, being kind, and being you know being compassionate as you do it. So you're going to start writing more books, right? You said you were interested. Oh yeah, I I would I have a couple started. I just you know I don't have a lot of time. Just getting the daughter lessons book out was an incredible push at the end. Um, but yeah, I have a couple started for sure. When did you finish the book? Um, I finished the book about a year ago, and it took about a year to get it, you know, done, edited, done, get the pick the cover, do do all that, um, and get it out. And we got it out right before Mother's Day. That's cool. What advice to writers out there that like want to get a book written or don't necessarily call themselves writers, but they have these ideas in their head, and they're like, I want to get this book done. Um, what what's sort of the mindset that you have to have in order to get it across the finish line? Carve out some time every day to write. Just carve out some time. Get up a half an hour earlier if you have to and just sit down and do it. My little passion project of every day for a month I'm going to uh, write a lesson for my daughters. I mean that certainly got me a substantial way forward towards the goal. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it, but you do gain some momentum over time and you, you see, you, you just, you don't realize what a big accomplishment it is um, until you actually see it. My, uh, um, my 
paralegal Jane, she and I have been together for 20 years, and she called me, um, you know, I think it was one of the first days of April, and she said, your book's on barnesandnoble.com. And I thought, wow, it is? <laughs> so I, I looked it up, and it was really, it was, it almost made my heart stop. And then I thought, wow, I am, this is a very vulnerable moment because you're out there and this thing that I've been passionate about is out there and this is talking about details of my of my personal life and about the you know two people that I love the most in in my life my world and wow I have really done this but I have also gotten so many um, lovely notes and comments and phone calls and the, the uh, people that this book has resonated with is really amazing. I mean, when I set out to do this, and I still hold this, really, this thought right now, the only two people who need to read that book are on the cover with me. Anyone else who reads it now is a bonus. And I think that when, when we, it's kind of like you're, uh, your go-giver book. So when you do something, not for the reward, but for the love, love of it, um, that's when things really turn magical. And I think that this book has a little bit of that going for it. I love that concept. Uh, I think we forget that, especially as content creators, you know, and, and, and storytellers. Oh gosh, we're always thinking about the intentionality of of a of a piece, right? Like when we're doing social media, we're like, all right, what is the intention of this post, and make sure that it has intention. But you know, it's it's fun to think about. We're just creating content. Like, there's what? Why not on some of these just like have fun, right? And just create content because it's a piece of it's a video that we want to share. That's not necessarily advertising driven or marketing driven, right? You're, you're absolutely right about that. I think that um, at least in the law, and maybe this is true in the work you do that's tangential to the law, I think we start um, trying to take our humanity out of what it is we do. And I look at it, again, I, I tend to look at most things differently than, than certainly other lawyers, but I think of it like this. There's a lot of good lawyers. There's a lot of smart lawyers. I mean, yeah, I'm, I might be smart, I'm a good writer, and I'm sure there's a hundred people out there who are smarter, and a hundred people, you know, just in, just in the square mile that are better writers than I am. So how can I distinguish myself um, from them. So when I, uh, in so social media, and I, I do post quite a bit to LinkedIn, and I have a, a nice following there, what I try to do is just be a person and be, be the person that I am, show who I am, because I think that's what's going to distinguish me. And maybe I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Maybe they're not going um, to, they're not going to relate to this lawyer who is, you know, all about her humanity. <laughs> but maybe they are. Maybe they are. Because in the end, um, we, we, can't, we can't divorce ourselves from the fact that we are, are living, breathing people with feelings. And for most of us, the work that we do is what we do to fuel our, our families, our households, and our passions. And um, our passion may not be what's paying us, but somehow we can we can uh, try to intersect the two um, and make our work a little more joyful. No, I love that. What, what would you say to somebody that's like afraid to be themselves, afraid because they're, you know, afraid to put themselves out there to be themselves because they're afraid to be ridiculed or judged? What do you say to those people? Um, I think one of the one of the benefits of of doing the work, you know, knowing who you are, uber important. Got to know who you are, and know who you're not. Um, you need to do that. I think just the wisdom of time. 
Um, I will be honest with you. I care very little what people think of me. Very little. I do. I do care what my children think of me because you know they're they're my kids. They're permanent. I do care about my my significant other, um, my partner. But we, um, you know, by and large, it is a very very small group that um, I really care about their opinions. The opinion that I care about the most is mine. So if I feel good about what I'm doing and I'm not hurting somebody else or offending somebody else, because I do ask myself those questions. Hey, I don't want to make someone else feel uncomfortable. Um, I always want to have a message of kindness going out there, messages about justice. I, you know, I, I do say some hard things, but I try to say them um, in a way that is, that is compassionate. Um, but if you care about anyone's opinion, care about your own. And, you know, because in the end, there, there's always going to be haters. But <laughs> so what? Who, care, who cares what they think anyway? No doubt. Bernadette Catalana, fantastic interview. I really appreciate you being here. How can people find you if they want to find uh, you? I think for, for those who are listening to this, it's a, a legal podcast. So LinkedIn is probably the best way to find me. Um, so I, yeah, you Bernadette Catalana on LinkedIn, MGM, the law firm. Uh, I also have an Instagram. I also have an Instagram page. Um, and um, I have, I was looking at it yesterday. I have, I have over 8,000 followers on Instagram, which is, that's kind of a lot of responsibility, a but lot. I love it. It's, it's my scrapbook. I try to, again, try to keep it light, um, but I feel like it documents my life and just try to, try to send some inspiration out there to people. I, I know I get inspiration from seeing what other people are doing at times. And I think, oh, if I'm doing something fun, especially in New York, I'll send it out. So, um, and, and most people who follow me, I follow them back so that I can keep up with them as well. Well, you have um, a, a really nice brain. I really like the perspective and mindset. And I uh, can't wait to read the book. I read a lot of books. So, you know, I'm awesome. all about uh, experiencing, you know, some new stuff. So, well, let I me send you one. And I'll, yeah. um, you can email me and I, I can sign it and maybe sign it for you and your wife and your, yeah. and your little girl. I would love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was so nice talking to you. I enjoyed Good talking it. talking to you. All right. And that was Spaghetti on the Wall, ladies and gentlemen, brought to you by Leduc Entertainment for all of your social marketing, podcasting needs. We got you. And you can watch Spaghetti on the Wall anywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, just Google us, you'll find us super easy. And we'll see y'all next week.